what I experienced and, and I'm sure what you experienced with your mom's loss and getting pregnant with Nixie shortly thereafter is how intertwined the connection of birth and death are. Those experiences are so, they're so linked in a really beautiful and spooky and magical way, I think. Hello and welcome. I am Amber Magnolia Hill, and this is Medicine Stories, where we are exploring what it is to be human upon the earth through interviews that center on ancestry, herbalism, myth, mind, and magic. And sometimes we dive into motherhood as well, as in today's podcast interview with Alila Diane. And music, myth, mind, magic, motherhood, and music. Uh, Alila and I talk about her unique name, her feral childhood, and her deeply rooted familial musical inheritance, the painful life experiences that led her to start making her own music, songs that come in dreams or that contain premonitions or foreknowledge of the future, And then we move into talking about motherhood and the intersection of motherhood and work and creativity. We talk about touring as a mom, uh, taking them with and leaving them home. And our experiences of weaning our daughters. We both have two girls. And Leela tells the whole story of how she almost lost her life, bringing her second daughter into the world, giving her second daughter her life. Um, And then we close with a little story about how she knew when her grandmother had passed, even though she was uh, an ocean away, she had, she had the sense that it had happened. Um, I'm going to, in this intro, just share a little bit about my recent weaning experience with my two-year-old. I posted about it on Instagram last night and had a lot of people um, telling their own stories or commenting or messaging me asking how I did it or to talk a little more about it on the podcast. So I'll just spend a few minutes here. And of course, as always, if you're not interested, you can skip forward. So it just so happens that I weaned both my girls around Christmas time. Um, And since their birthdays are really close in the year, just three weeks apart, although they're 10 years and three weeks apart, that was around Christmas for both of them. So I just thought that was kind of a neat echo. And, um, I just like it that they were close in age. I don't know. There's, you know, so many differences in their childhoods and, in my experience of mothering them, I, I think it's sweet that those sort of, that symmetry is there with them being weaned at the same time. But what happened with Nixie is that I've been thinking about it for a while, probably since she turned two, um, but it just wasn't the right time. And I had really wanted to go until two with both the girls just for all the good nutritional reasons. Um, and for the love and the bonding and the skin to skin contact. And, you know, I really have enjoyed it for the most part. And I think what happens for a lot of us is that we get to the point that we stop enjoying it so much. And I was getting there. There would still be at least one nursing session a day that I enjoyed, usually after she woke up, either from nighttime or her nap. And she'd be really sweet and nurse for a long time, clearly getting a lot of milk. But then there was the rest of the day when it was more demanding and kind of on and off. And I was starting to get really fed up with those. Uh, We went to a nice Thanksgiving gathering at a friend's house, and she just kept wanting to nurse while we were there, I think because she was so overwhelmed by all the people and the noise, and I get that as a highly sensitive person myself. Um, I'm really attuned to her when we're in situations like that, so I wanted to provide that home base and that comfort for her, but I was also like, I don't want to keep getting my boobs out in this gathering here, and you know, there's kids close to her age, although they were older there. Um, And I knew both of their moms had weaned them at two. And I was just kind of thinking, I think you're, you're like ready to be one of these big kids now, or you're really close. So I started thinking about it then. And then a few days later, a dear friend was over and I was telling her that I was just kind of starting to feel that way. And that Thanksgiving really brought it up. And 
she told me that with her oldest, she nursed him until he was three and she was really ready to be done and had been for a while. She was overwhelmed with it. Um, but her La Leche League leader, you know, said like, you have to keep going. You have to let the child totally lead the process. And she said she was actually like, she still has anger towards this woman for that. And, you know, baby led weaning sounds great. And me and this other mother both think that you should nurse for a good long while, much longer than, you know, the doctors tell people to. Um, but she should have stopped long before then. And so when she got pregnant with her second, five years later, she was recommended the book Tears and Tantrums or Tantrums and Tears. And um, so I got it after her visit. And, you know, basically the point that this book is making is that it's okay for babies and little ones to cry. Um, They don't need to be given whatever they're demanded immediately 100% of the time especially when you know they're not hungry. So let's just focus on nursing. Um, it's just something that they've come to want. Obviously, this is beyond you know the first few weeks or months of life. That just sitting with them and holding them and looking at them and reflecting back, you're really sad. I understand. I'm here with you. We're going to get through this together. Uh, and so my friend told the story that when her second one was tiny, like a newborn, she was screaming and screaming and demanding to nurse, but she knew she wasn't hungry and she knew she didn't want to establish the patterns that she had with her oldest. So she just held her in her lap, like looking at her, you know, close, like that that distance that babies can can see you still at that age. And was just like, I see you're so upset. I see you're so, I love you. I'm here with you and it's going to be okay. You know, whereas with her oldest, she would have just immediately nursed. Um, And she said that all of a sudden her daughter just stopped crying and did that (gasps) thing that babies and people do when we have gotten our good cry out and just like peacefully relaxed into sleep. And so she kind of held that throughout her second child's um, infancy and it was so much better for her. And, you know, she's an attachment parenting mom, as am I, I think, a lot of people, probably a lot of people who listen to this kind of vibe with that. Um, But as anyone who listened to episode 11 of this podcast already knows my episode where it's just me talking about motherhood and isolation and how our ideals fall apart and um, just how hard it is to parent in modern society. Um, There's, there's room for flexibility within that framework and you can still love and be close and do a lot of those attachment parenting things, which I hate that phrase. It makes it sound so like new. And that's how a lot of people think of it is like, oh, it's this new fad of attachment parenting. It's like ancestral parenting it is how humans and mammals have always parented. Um, and it's just, I, I fully have so much compassion for like the whole spectrum of how moms feed their kids. And if they're nursing, when it's time for them to be done. So I was really at the place where I was just wanting to be done. And after my friend told me that, I did that with Nixie. And it was probably only two, maybe three times where she came to me wanting to nurse after that. And I was just like, nope, but I'll hold you and I'll love you through all the crying. And got through it in five or ten minutes and then she was fine. And then she respected my nose much more often after that when she approached me wanting to nurse. Mama, nurse, mama, nurse, mama, nurse. I just, I was about to lose my mind if I heard that phrase again. And it should be such a sweet phrase, right? But it was just too much. Too much was being demanded of me. And I think physically too, my body was like, let's be done. So a couple weeks ago, we went a whole day without nursing. I thought that would be it. Then the next morning, my breasts were so engorged, and it was the three-year anniversary of my mom's death, and I was PMSing and having a lot of big feelings. And so when she woke up in the morning and said, Mama Ness, I was like, yeah, okay, let's do this. Um, but it, the production like really slowed down after that, and my nose became a lot more frequent. And then just four days ago, I just decided, like, no more. I I think we're actually done now. I feel so done. I actually feel like um, a physical revulsion at the thought of nursing again. And so once that no, the energetic no became so strong in me, it was just so easy for me to say no. And she never did the meltdown thing. I mean, she asked 
over and over a couple times, but most times I said no. She was like, okay, and we moved on. And now we're done. And I feel so happy. I don't feel any sadness or nostalgia. I'm just ready to have my body back, to wear whatever I want, to be able to be out of the house at certain times of the day that I haven't been able to for two years and three months. Um, I'm just stoked. And so I share that because we've talked about motherhood a number of times on the podcast. And Alila shares her story of how her youngest was weaned um, that she didn't really plan for is sort of a unexpected thing that came up and dried up her milk supply. And um, yeah, so that's why I share that story. Thank you for listening. And I think, yeah, I think that's about it. Uh, one thing is that Alila and I talk about how her song, The Wind, has been featured in a previous episode. So this was episode six with Amy Woodruff. If you want to go back and hear that after hearing Alila and I talk about it, episode six. And of course, you can Google or buy any of the songs that Alila and I talk about in this interview, um, especially Oh My Mama, because it's just so relevant to what we're saying and such a beautiful song. And for Patreon supporters, um, Alila is going to be giving away a copy of her latest album called Cusp, which is about motherhood. So I'm going to read a little thing here about this album. Oh, sorry, I got things popping up on my screen. Um, Patreon is patreon.com slash medicine stories. And it's for supporters of this podcast at the $2 level. Really helps to keep the show going. And I'm so super grateful to everyone who's there. It's a really sweet community and um, just nourishes me and nourishes the show. So... This is from an interview that Alila did in, I think it's called Mother Magazine. She says, this music is about motherhood. Even just by saying that, it feels like people will write you off. It's like you've suddenly lost the charm of being youthful and even attainable. You've been commoditized as available. There is not a big place in the music industry for 30-something women with kids making music. She laughs as she pauses, then adds, maybe we can create that space. So um, I will link to that article in the show notes for this episode is what I will do. And that is going to serve as the bio for Alila. And we'll also talk about her childhood and how she came to make music. Um, so that's it. If you want to be part of the Medicine Stories Facebook group, go ahead and just find us by searching for Medicine Stories. You might have noticed a new logo for the show. I'm so excited about it. I feel like it just really embodies the sort of mythic themes that we're dealing with here and um, I love the stars you know for me they really represent the ancestors as so many traditional people thought the stars were their ancestors and as the stars actually are our ancestors because all of the um, elements in our body came from exploding stars it was so amazing and then the redwoods deeply ancestral trees because they hold such ancient wisdom and the poppies at the bottom, you know, which um, are just evocative of like the dream time and, oh, extra special states of consciousness. <laughs> and then the redwoods and the poppies too, both being such California plants and me coming at you from California. Thank you so much to my graphic designer, Juniper, for the new logo. I love it. And this will be the last episode before Christmas. I hope you guys have really sweet holidays, whichever ones you celebrate. As I said in the last intro, I absolutely love this time of year. So I'm really in my happy place and that feels good. And I'll be back. I'll be back. I have not done seasons with this podcast, but I feel like starting with the next episode that will come out, it's kind of a new, a new season, a new energy has been flowing through me lately related to this project and this creation. And I'm just really excited about all the new interviews coming up. I'm uh, really grateful for everyone who is here. Thank you so much. Um, oh, yeah, one last little thing you will hear in the episode that this was recorded three months ago. And so this is part of why I took a big interviewing break is because I just really needed to catch up on getting interviews out. So um, just in case that's confusing with things I've talked about in the intro and then things Alila and I will talk about, we'll talk about in this interview, there's a three-month lapse there. 
Um, okay, thank you so much for listening, and let's get into this interview now with Alila Diane. All right, hi Alila. Hi Amber. Thanks for being here. I'm glad to talk with you today. Yeah, me too. So I want to start out, this is kind of like three questions in one, but I think they all tie in. I want to hear about okay. your name, your childhood, and how you started <laughs> making music. Okay. So my name, Alila, is a palindrome. It's spelled the same backwards and forwards. And I was named this, um, well, a few days before I was born, my mom was quite pregnant and my brother was three years old at the time. And my dad was giving him a ride on his shoulders. And my dad was like, hey, Ryan, what's the horse's name? And my brother said, La Lila. And both of my parents were like, huh, La Lila, a Lila. That's a really beautiful name. And they named me that a few days <laughs> later. So it was really uh, stumbled upon, and that's why it's so unique. I love that. <laughs> yeah. And then my childhood, I was born in Humboldt County, and my family moved to Nevada City um, when I was about a year old. And the story goes that I was such a, a difficult newborn. I just screamed all the time. And up in um, Eureka in Humboldt County where my parents had been living. They were very, very young when they had me. And I just screamed all the time and they couldn't handle it. And they were trying to live off of the land. And my mom was like growing all of their own vegetables and doing everything. And with the second, the arrival of the second child and one who me screamed all the time, um, they kind of threw in the towel on that life. And my mom cut off her very, very long braids. And they moved to Southern California for about six months. And my dad um, tried to have a, he became a dental lab technician. So he made gold teeth, like crowns and that sort of thing. But he, at the time, was, I think, 26. And he didn't have a college degree and didn't have any thing to support his family. So he did that. And then after that, they moved to Nevada City. And I grew up in Nevada City, as you know, where you live, a beautiful, sweet, gold mining town that looks like it's from a country western movie. Um, yeah, and I had a, I had a pretty sweet childhood there. Um, yeah, very much going to the river and exploring the woods behind our house. And I don't even remember what your third question is now. <laughs> so your dad was a musician, yes. that right? Yeah, and then... So I became a musician, mm -hmm. yes. Both of my parents were mu musicians. Um, much of my childhood was very full of going to potlucks and having all of the adults just kind of play bluegrass music. That was my parents, Marie's parents. I'm going to um, interject here that Marie yeah. is is your best childhood friend, and it's her music that opens this show mm -hmm. from her song Wild Eyes. Yes. So my mom and dad and Marie's dad um, were in a bluegrass, in several bluegrass, bluegrass bands together, actually. Um, and so that music really kind of inundated my spirit, um, very rootsy acoustic music. And then as I got older, um, that type of music faded out a little bit and my dad started a Grateful Dead cover band. <laughs> and then while I was in junior high and high school, it was Dead Beats rehearsal at our house um, <laughs> at least once a week. And so that kind of I'm only, I, I wouldn't say I'm a huge fan of the Grateful Dead, but it's definitely still inside of me because I was subjected to it um, so intensely. And then as far as my own music, um, I sang in the school choir and I really didn't participate in my parents' musicality when I was a kid. I mean, aside from 
kind of knowing the words to all of their songs. I never played music with my parents. Um, I sang in the school choir, and then when I was 19, um, I moved away. I moved to San Francisco, and I did bring a guitar with me. My dad had showed me a couple of chords, I think, when I was 16. Um, and then when I was 19, I... I moved to San Francisco. My parents got a divorce, which was extremely difficult for my spirit. Um, my high school boyfriend slash your ex-partner and father of your child. <laughs> um, my oldest child. Let me put that yes, in. Father of your oldest child. Now 12. Um, broke up with me. My heart was broken. My parents were splitting up. And I started writing songs at that, at that point in my life. I, I was kind of, I was feeling that when you um, mentioned that the divorce of your parents and the loss of your family home at 20 was, was big for you because it, it was. I, yeah, I went through the same thing at 25 and it was, I knew the divorce was a long time coming and I was all yeah. for it because my dad was just a full on alcoholic at that yeah, point. Yeah. Um, but my childhood home, I still dream about it so almost I every night. Too. I do too. Actually, I haven't dreamed about mine in a couple of years, I think. But I have written a lot of songs about dreaming of my childhood home. And um, yeah, it definitely is part of my dream world. And that that devastation um, when your parents split up, I think no matter how old you are, is always a really difficult thing to process. And that was definitely the case for me. Um, and that's the reason I started writing songs. And you found success pretty early on. Were you expecting, were you expecting that? I was not. Um, I really started writing music because it was an outlet for me and it was a way for me to process my, the grief I was feeling around all of those losses that I experienced in that moment. Um, and it's always, been a way for me to process whatever's going on in my life. So I didn't know that the music would take me as far as it has. And I started playing shows and I, I moved to Portland um, in 2005. I had been in Nevada. I was in San Francisco. I moved back to Nevada City, which is where I recorded my first album with my dad. Um, and then I moved to Portland and I just started playing a lot of shows to kind of see what would happen. And much to my surprise, my record got into the hands of someone who passed it along to a friend in um, London. And my record came out on a small record label in the US and also a small record label overseas. And it was mostly in England and in France that my music really took off and that was in 2007 and that was pretty surprising and very surreal. I remember December of 2005 this is the first time we met uh, me and my ex who at that time was your ex but at that time was yes. not my ex was my current. <laughs> um, I was newly pregnant and we came up to Oregon to look at a biodiesel van because we were going to tour <laughs> this <yeah>. country <laughs> working on organic farms in our biodiesel van <laughs> and the van didn't work out we were like let's go to Portland and it's like evening is coming on it's rainy and we're like we have nowhere to stay. We we, do we know go. any what are we doing <laughs> we're like 24 and pregnant and what's happening and um he called you and we stayed at your place and I remember you it seriously gives me chills thinking about it <laughs> you you played your new song for us and you yodeled I did so beautiful. <laughs> of course I did <laughs> and oh, I could like feel really it funny. resonating through my my pregnant body and wow yeah. <laughs> That's, I remember when you guys showed up and said you were pregnant. I was like, whoa, this is crazy. I mean, I hadn't seen Graham in quite a while at that point. <laughs> and you were probably, I think you were like one of the very first people to know too. Yes. Like no I remember yet. that. Yeah. I remember that. You were very newly pregnant. And I think you were feeling quite ill. Mm. Um, <laughs> yes. The nausea of early pregnancy is real. Um, 
Yeah. That was a while ago. <laughs> that was a while ago. And, um, but you know, I've always just loved your song, Oh My Mama. And when you talk about, is it someday you'll have a daughter? And, you know, I was pregnant with a girl at that time. And now I have two girls. And then when you were first pregnant with Vera and you announced that it was a girl, I was just like, oh my God, like your, your song came true. It did. I remember when I was pregnant, I remember singing that song for the first time after I knew that I was going to have a daughter. And that was a really surreal experience to just kind of know that I that my song was coming true. And I've done that a lot of times with songs. It's very weird. Um, yeah, they kind of, a lot of them have some strange magic or some strange knowledge that, um, I don't know, it's weird. <laughs> that, I mean, that makes me think that like you're I don't, like you're a true artist who's really <laughs> paying attention to what's coming to you. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's very magical. I mean, I've, I've written songs about dreams. I've written songs about I sort of premonitions, I guess in that way. Um, but I think the most magical songs are the ones that sort of, I don't have any ownership over. I mean, I don't really have any ownership over any of them, but the ones that I really feel like just come out of me suddenly. And I'm like, whoa, this song really wanted to exist. Um, yeah, those are my probably most cherished songs, I think. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, and I'm just remembering now as we're talking that in episode six of this podcast with Amy Woodruff, we played your song, The Wind. Yes. Um, in full. That's still the only time I've played a song <laughs> on this show. Um, so funny. Yeah, will you tell us about that song? Yeah, that song is very intense. Um, so as you all, as you spoke about on that podcast with Amy, um, Amy's dear friend, Cherie, was tragically killed. Um, and, I, and I didn't know Cherie, but after that happened, I remember hearing about it and it really hit me hard and I was really spooked by the whole thing and freaked out and um, devastated that something so tragic could happen to a young woman, you know, no different than me or you. And I started having these dreams. I think it happened twice, at least twice. Um, and the dream was I went down into this kind of basement. I was being called into this dark area. And down there, there was a piano. And I remember seeing the piano. And the keys were moving. It, the keys were moving, but there, I could, there was no one sitting at the piano. Sort of like a player piano where you see the song being played. Um, but there's no one there. And I had the intense feeling that that was Cherie and she was playing a song and I woke up and it kind of left an impression on me. And then maybe a week later I had the dream again and the song was being played. And after that pretty within the next day or two, I sat down and that song really kind of came out of me and and I was thinking about her and it it was a song that I wrote for her and also strangely enough the chorus that I'm on the wind part was a piece of this song that my ex-husband Tom had written it's important to acknowledge that that I am on the wind that was this thing that he had been tossed around and there was this old recording of him doing that. So that song we co-wrote. So the verses were very much inspired by that dream and by Cherie. And then that I'm on the wind, I just, it felt so connected to the whole thing and it made it, it fit perfectly with the whole story. And that's what I was trying to say. And he had already written those words. I think about something completely unrelated and I put all the pieces together and that's how the song was written. 
Wow, that's amazing, that dream that you had. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, and that after that episode came out, in which you know Amy tells the whole story of her friendship with Cherie and Cherie's death, and um, how Amy processed it being seven months pregnant, right. her best friend's murder. It's a really beautiful episode, but so it's just I love that your song is in it. It's so powerful, and so many people wrote to me afterwards to say that they just you know got chills when they heard that song and to thank me for introducing me to your music. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. It's just very beautiful that you were able to honor her in that way. Yeah. Um, have you had other, is there other, more overlap between your dream life and your songwriting? Um, another song of mine, the rifle, um, which is an earlier song. I wrote that song while I was traveling around alone in France and I was in the South of France and I was staying in a hostel and I had a dream about my childhood home. And it was this very intense thing where there was something, I don't, I don't know what it was, but something was coming from the woods and you know, we lived on a, a couple of acres and there was this wooded area just beyond a field on our property. And it was a, it was a very intense dream. And I woke up at like, I don't know, four in the morning in a room full of, you know, sleeping, sleeping hostel people, whoever they were, because that's how it goes <laughs> at hostels. And I scrawled down all the words for that song, which is something I've never done before that and never done since then of just like waking up from a dream and writing this whole thing down. So I wrote down all those words and I fell back asleep. And then I woke up some hours later and picked up my guitar and I just sang the song and it was just done. It was, that was it. Hmm. I love that one. I remember watching that video a lot when it first came out. Yeah. And, you know, with that song, I wrote it about my ch my family home and a lot of the lyrics are true. Like my mom is a painter and my brother literally watched after their, after my parents got a divorce, my mom just kind of didn't want anything to do with much of anything. And she burnt all of her paintings. Mm. And my brother and all of his good friends, they were about 20 at the time. They sat around and watched all the paintings burn in this bonfire, super intense. And they were all crying. It was just like this sad, sad thing that happened. And, but I had this very odd experience um, recently. Last time I was on tour, I was in Europe and I was in Amsterdam and I was singing that song on stage and this flood of intense energy kind of came while I was singing that song. And I realized that for other people, it totally is also telling the story of the Holocaust. And I had never realized that before mm -hmm. with the last line of the song, there's too many heavy boots and just being mm -hmm. in Amsterdam and singing those words, it had a, it had an entirely different meaning. And it was, it was really, um, Strange that I hadn't realized that earlier. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, I can see it is um, a heavy. It's a heavy song. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, an ending. Yeah. Um, uh, that's just, you know, hearing music and having a real emotional reaction. It's making me think of spirit weavers and joshua tree in 2014 where you were there that was it was my first year of the three years that i went and you were there with baby vera she was like yes. seven months old yes she was very little yeah <laughs> you were gonna perform that night and i was like alisa what are you gonna do with vera while you perform I was like i have no idea <laughs> yeah. and i was like well i'll take her you know i you need someone to take her yeah. obviously and that was so sweet of you. Strapped her to me in your baby carrier. And right as the sun was going down, you know, she was screaming and crying. And I just walked. Was. Yeah. I was, I was like, I'm sorry, baby. Walked as far away from 
camp and people as I could get. And it ended up being like so magical because Aww. we were like out alone in Joshua Tree in the high desert, you know. Yeah. And it took her like ten minutes, which feels like a lifetime when you've got a screaming when you have baby. A screaming baby. Yeah. But you know, I knew she'd be fine, and I was just kind of trying to put off that energy. And anyway, that was super magical. But Aww. then I get back, she's passed out. You do this beautiful set, and I was sitting there watching you, sitting next to my new friend Amen. And you did a, another particular song that's related to our ex. And it was just this full circle moment where I had this baby with him and then our lives and relationship fell apart. And even though I initiated it and it was one of the best decisions I've ever made, it's still heartbreaking. And it brought of me course. right back to that, that feeling of just hating that my family broke apart. Yeah. And that you were one of the first people who knew we were pregnant with our little girl and I'm holding your little girl and I was oh like oh my gosh she was like what is going on yeah, completely hysterical and then after your your uh, performance was over I ran into Amy's mom Denny and she was crying because of oh. the wind and the Cherie song oh that was gosh. just ah uh, Joshua Tree you know, you know what else I really yeah. remember about that too is you being like why do I have my baby in the middle of the desert right Yeah, now? like this is hard. This yeah. Is hard. Yeah. I uh, took Vera to Spirit Weavers two years in a row, once in Joshua Tree and then the next year um, in, what is the location? It's in oh, Mendocino. It's in Mendocino, Not yes. the desert. It's not the redwoods. Not in the desert. <laughs> um, and it was really hard to have yeah. a, a – to be camping with a small child, um, maybe a little too hard for me. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I took my Celia to the Women's Herbal Symposium when she was just about to turn two. She was like the age Nixie is right now, like a week from turning two. And um, I left after the first night. I was like, this isn't, yeah. I'm not learning anything. I can't it take just, a class. I can't connect with nope. anyone. I'm stressed out of my mind. Yeah, you kind of realize what you're capable of and – when you have to just flee situations with small children. Yeah. It's okay. It is what it is. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I haven't been back to Spirit Weavers since. And I did the Good Medicine Confluence with Nixie the last two years. And I'm not going to do it next. I just, yeah. Uh, it's not. It's a lot. It's, it's not. a hard moment in our lives. It is. Hard it's chapter. so intense. It's so intense. So, I wanted to ask you, um, because you were on a European tour Yes. And I assumed you had your kids with you. And I was like, that's crazy. No, but then I saw no. a post that you did it. And I was like, that's crazy too. Like that's that must have been crazy. a really hard decision yes. for her to make. And how did that work and what happened? So yeah, I just, I'd love to hear well, about that. I, we did a tour. Actually, I toured with Vera when I only had one child. Um, we took her on a European tour when she was seven months old or seven or eight months old. And we, I had my husband with me and I had my in-laws with me and we rented an RV and that was the solution. Like, okay, we'll do this and we'll just have a lot of family here to help. And it was fun. It was like weird family circus vacation where I was also somehow pretending to be a professional musician. Um, and then a few years later when Vera was two and I had released um, Cold Moon, which is a collaborative record I made with my friend Ryan Francesconi, um, a guitar player. So we made this record and we went on a European tour. And Vera was a very emotional, um, just a super sensitive child. She always has been. And when she was two, there was no way I could fathom leaving her. It just wasn't, it didn't feel possible so we went on this tour and Torin came, my husband came, and we drove around in a van with Vera, who was two, and it was horrible. It was so difficult. Um, it was also, it was in November of 2015, which is when the Paris uh, terrorist attacks happened at a venue at, all around Paris. And it, that happened at a venue I had performed at before and we were, I was on stage outside of Paris that night that, that, that it happened. And there was something so intense. Um, that was just a really heavy time to be over there and to, be, to have my child with me. It, it felt really raw 
and um, it was a really difficult tour. And after that, I never wanted to do that again. I I just it didn't it didn't feel like it was um, a good idea for anybody for me to be dragging my kid around foreign countries and strap her in the car seat for seven hours a day sometimes like it felt inhumane Mm -hmm. and so um shortly after that tour I went to an artist residency for three weeks and I did leave Vera at home and I wrote all of the songs on my newest record Cusp which is very much um inspired by motherhood and Six months after that, I became pregnant with Una, and I recorded that album when I was pregnant, and I knew that I did not want to be taking children on tour, so it was a deliberate decision when I decided not to release that album um, for a year after Una was born, so I released it when she was one, and shortly there actually just before she turned one, um, I went away for two weeks without her. And she was, she was 11 months old. I was pumping, but my breast pump broke. That was horrible. I was in France and my breast pump broke because of the power difference. And I hadn't Mm -hmm. like thought of that in advance. So the thing shorted out. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was super devastating to be far away. And then I got this horrible hand pump thing and I'm like hand pumping for two weeks. And when I got home, my supply was pretty much completely dried up. And that, that was hard. That was probably the hardest thing about deciding to leave my child when she was so small. Um, yeah. And then I went again in April, I went for three weeks and it was really good to be able to be back doing my thing and to, to be, um, to be able to give myself wholly to my art and to sing the songs night after night. I loved that tour. It was so fun. And I had two other women with me, my friends, my friend Heather and my friend Mira, and they are my backing band. And so it was very like empowering. Um, to leave the kids at home. But of course I missed them. Mm -hmm. We FaceTimed every day. Um, But I know it was the right decision. Mm -hmm. And it worked better for me than trying to bring them along. I think the times I brought Vera with me, it felt like I was half-assing both jobs. Mm -hmm. And not not being um, able to fully give myself to the audience to really like put on a good show, you know, being so exhausted from having a jet lagged kid on tour. So that, that didn't feel fair to not be able to put on a good show and also to make my kid travel so much. It's just so hard to move your body around every day like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's a hard decision to make, but I feel so grateful that I can still go and sing and that I haven't completely sacrificed that or given that up because I have kids. I really admire it because I, I lean toward sacrificing myself. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. (laughs) And uh, I mean, yeah, it was kind of like a revelation for me when I realized you didn't have your kids with you on that tour. And I was like, God, I respect that. Um, um, just right now I'm really starting to think about weaning Nixie. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, but no, like, she's still benefiting and I love it and I love her and it'll be hard. But then I'm like, oh my God, I remember, you, you know. know, with, with <laughs> Micey, what it, what it felt like to have my body back and how. Yeah. I feel very happy about having my body back. And, you know, this time it's earlier, Vera's on, or sorry, Una's only 18 months old and she's, she did nurse a little bit when I got back in April, like off of there was one boob who that's who <laughs> there was one boob that still had some milk left like a tiny bit so she would nurse maybe for five minutes once a day in the morning for a while after I got back and I was grateful for that because it was really sweet 
Um, and maybe a month or two ago, it completely ended. And I breastfed Vera till she was two. So this, you know, was a lot earlier. And it's sad, especially because I know I'm not going to ever do that again. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to have any more children. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's the kind of guilt that comes up of like, oh, I you know, I went on tour and my, my supply dried up and I was giving my baby formula, but that was the right decision for us. And I, I have managed to let go of, or at least to the best of my ability, I really try to, to dissipate any feelings of like selfishness or something or guilt that I have around that because it was the right decision for us and she is fine and it's okay that it's okay that that happened. I mean, it's not necessarily how I had envisioned it happening. I thought I was going to happily pump breast milk on tour, but what was I supposed to do? The breast pump broke. <laughs> it's like <laughs> there I was with engorged breasts in Paris, France <laughs> and no baby to relieve me. And that, like, that's motherhood is it is your ideals crashing down oh, yeah. around you and Definitely. compromising so everyone yeah. survives. Yeah, I think, I mean, touching back on, on music, like, this Una's birth was extremely traumatic, and something about that and having I had a near death experience when she was born and that kind of has reinvigorated me in just being alive and feeling like like while I was on tour I think in the past I used to very much um kind of resent certain aspects of tour or think it was hard um but this time I was just glad to be there like this is so cool that I'm in London and performing for this beautiful church full of people like I just I feel much more grateful for every day I have now after that experience I was gonna ask about that would you would you share about your pregnancy and birth with Una yeah um it's related to Touches on what happened with Vera as well, because it was a similar thing. But um, I had something called HELP syndrome when Vera was born. Um, and she had to, I had to be induced at 38 weeks. And it's like HELP syndrome. H-E-L-L-P. It's similar to preeclampsia. Um, you have low blood platelets, um, elevated liver enzymes, and high blood pressure. And so obviously that's not a very good thing for your body to be dealing with. And the result can be seizures and death, basically. So the solution for it is to induce you to get the baby out of your body because it's basically your body having a negative reaction to being pregnant. So Vera was born at 38 weeks and I knew theoretically, oh, that was a close call. I had this thing called HELP syndrome. Whoa, but I'm okay because they caught it early enough. Um, but my recovery was lengthy and my body had been through a lot. Um, so fast forward to my pregnancy with Una, um, everything went pretty smoothly, just the normal morning sickness. Um, that was not fun. I, I'm, I'm pretty bad at being pregnant in general. I hate being pregnant. <laughs> it's like really hard on me. I'm. I puke for three months. Oh, it's yeah. really bad. Yeah, there's those so, sweet moments, yeah. but for the most yeah. part, it is so intense to it's grow rough. another human inside it is of you. Very intense. So, the middle of the pregnancy with Una, I recorded Cusp, which felt very appropriate because all of those songs are very much related to motherhood and seen through the lens of motherhood. So, that was a cool moment in that pregnancy. And then. I'm getting more and more pregnant, and it wasn't until the very end that things got wonky. Um, 
I think a few weeks before Uno was born, I had a low blood platelet reading, which was the thing that was the first symptom I had with Vera. And when that happened, I kind of just had this gut feeling that like, oh, shit's going down. Like this is not going the right direction anymore. And shortly thereafter, I I was advised to have a um, a blood pressure cuff at home because based on my um, based on what happened with Vera, they wanted to kind of watch me closely. And my blood pressure just started kind of inching up and um yeah so I it went above the threshold that they were comfortable with I went to the hospital and at this point I was 34 and a half weeks pregnant and they saw that I was getting help syndrome again and they induced me and she was born just shy of 35 weeks. And it was, it was really, the birth was okay. It was three hours. And I kept saying like, I just have to do this horrible giving birth thing. When you have help syndrome and you have low blood platelets, you're not allowed to have an epidural. So there's really no relief even offered to you. So it's being on Pitocin with no pain relief in the hospital, very medicalized IVs in, in both arms. Um, and being on Pitocin, I'll say for anyone who Pitocin, doesn't know yeah. super intensifies labor. Like it, it kind of puts you into an artificially artificial state of like hard labor. Hard quickly. labor. Yeah. Both of my labors were hard labor immediately mm, mm. with Vera. It was seven hours of hard labor. That was it. With Una, it was three hours of hard labor, and then she was born. So there's no easing in. It's just like all of a sudden you are having the most intense experience you've ever had in your entire life mm. and, and painful. Mm. Um, so Una was born in three hours of the hardest, most intense labor with no pain relief in the hospital. Um, and right as I was going into labor, they told me that – their NICU was full. The neonatal intensive care unit was full and that they were going to have to transfer her to another hospital as soon as she was born. So that was horrible. Um, I couldn't even believe it because I'm giving birth to a premature baby. And here they tell me that they're going to take her away the second she's born. Um, so that was, I was extremely, anxious, but I just had to kind of channel this belief that everything was going to be okay, um, given the circumstances. And she was born and they let me hold her for 20 minutes about because she was born breathing and she was okay, despite the fact that she was five pounds, you know, small, premature. Um, and then they took her away and my husband went with her to the other hospital across, across town. Um, and that is when shit really went south for me. Um, at that point, I just started bleeding. And I it was super scary. They were doing everything they could. They were giving me all these weird shots and pills and IVs of this and that to try to get my uterus to contract. And it wouldn't. And I just kept bleeding a lot um, until the following afternoon. She was born at one in the morning and the bleeding just kept kind of casually happening at unsafe levels all day. Um, and then, and I kind of, I felt myself really, it was weird. I felt so weak and I was drifting off and, you know, also imagine I don't know where my baby is. I can hardly talk to my husband. I'm having those like shakes, the those hormonal post labor, like your whole body is just shaking. I don't know mm -hmm. if that's what you remember, but that was happening all day. And then I had to go to the operating room and um, they did a procedure to stop the bleeding. Um, they installed, they put a 
something called a Bakri balloon in my uterus to stop the bleeding. Um, but before they did that, this is a really gruesome moment. Um, the doctor came in, did a ultrasound of my uterus and said, okay, there's a really large blood clot in your uterus. I think that that will stop the bleeding if I remove that. And she's like, do you mind if I just reach in and grab it? Oh my God. <laughs> and so she literally stuck her fist inside of me and grabbed the blood clot. And then I just kept bleeding and it was just like, oh. nothing would help. And it, it was horrible. Cause your cervix was open so she could access yeah. the uterus. <laughs> wow. It was bad. And then I went to the OR, they, they put the Bakri balloon in the, the bleeding stopped, but it was just like horrible hemorrhaging. The bleeding did stop. And after that, um, I just remember laying there feeling so weak. I could not move because I had lost so much of my life force and I had lost so much blood. Um, yeah. And I, I remember sending prayers up. I'm not a religious person, but I'm a spiritual person. And I I was sending up some messages there because I really felt how close I was to the edge. And they did blood transfusions and it was, yeah, it, it was really an ordeal. When did you see Una again? I saw Una the following day in the afternoon. So we were apart for about 36 hours, I think during which time I was like just on the edge and my husband wasn't there and he didn't even know mm. what was happening to me. My mom was oh, with wow. me, which I was so grateful for. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other eerie piece that left a lasting impression and traumatized me further was that when I went home, um, Una was in the NICU for a week Um that was hard because I was in such bad shape that for me physically to try to be there with her took all of my strength. I mean, I could hardly walk. I was wheeled up there the first few days. Um, but when I did go home, I just didn't get well. I, my energy didn't return and I just was laying in bed. My mom would bring me food and I would just sit there and nurse the baby. But my energy didn't come back the way it had after I had Vera. And I really felt like something was wrong. And um, at about two weeks postpartum, I used the bathroom and stood up and there was just blood all over the floor and we had to call an ambulance. And so then I went to the ER and they monitored me for like four hours and were kind of like, that was weird. I don't know why you bled so much. Like, we're gonna send you home. And they sent me home and then that happened like three more times at home, which is horrifying. Um, and then, Finally, I went back to the OR and they gave me a DNC and they discovered that there had been a small piece of placenta left behind in my uterus, mm -hmm. which is why I kept bleeding mm -hmm. for four weeks so intensely. Um, so it was a pretty, it was a pretty extreme um, thing to go through and it really like left me feeling how close I had gotten to not being able to be here to be a mother to my children. And that, um, yeah, it was real, really traumatic. Yeah. I mean, giving birth is <laughs> hard enough. Begin with, I right. know. Oh my God. No. Well, thank so. you for, I've, I've, I've wanted to hear the and whole story. Your podcast became a birth stories podcast. I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm uh, passionate about birth and yes, mothers. And, yeah. 
um, I've wanted to hear that whole story for for a while. Um, well, there you have it. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just this question came up for me was um, did Una have red hair when she came out? She did not. She had brown hair mm. and, and jaundice, so we were like, "Wow, she's so tan <laughs> right off the bat." And then only later we realized, like once they did the jaundice lights and all of that, um, she became very pale after that. She's very, very white, and she, and she sprouted red hair at about three months old, <laughs> and we were very shocked. <laughs> It's so cute. Um, and where does it come from? Which line? My husband's grandmother was a redhead, and my great grandma's sister had red hair also. Mm. And were they Celtic? Um, Torrin's family, I I'm not sure where she was where his grandmother is from. I know his grandfather was German. Um, I'll have to ask. I don't know. Yeah, I was just... English and Irish. Okay. Scottish, French. Yeah. Um, I'm just very European from a lot of different places on both sides. Yeah, uh, that's all my ancestry, too, that you just named, but also Dutch and Manx. Okay. Um, But I was was just thinking recently about my freckles, because I actually have a lot of freckles. And people (laughs) talked about it all the time when I was a kid, and they don't really anymore. And I texted my sister, and I was like, did mom have freckles? Does dad? Do you? And she's like, no, it's always been you. And I was like, just thinking about how things come up through, you know. They do, yeah. And I was looking up red, or I was looking up freckles, and then red hair, of course, came up as a part of that. And it really is only, you know, a small subset of of peoples who have red hair, especially. And yeah, mostly the British Isles. Yeah. (laughs) That's so special. (laughs) So cute. It is. It's really sweet. I mean, we're, we're glad we have her. We're glad we're all alive. It's just, yeah. Yeah. I I mean, yeah. You know, uh, you mentioned November, 2015. That's the month my mom died and I got pregnant a few weeks later and it was, kind of just holding holding what a miracle it is to be alive and all and what a blessing it is to have any of the time that we have with the people that we love that is so true that is so true um I think also what I experienced and and I'm sure what you experienced with your mom's loss and getting pregnant with Nixie shortly thereafter is how intertwined the connection of birth and death are. Mm -hmm. Those experiences are so, they're so linked um, in a really beautiful and spooky and magical way, I think. Yep. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So before we end, I was also wanting to hear more about this story um, about, your your grandmother's passing and when you were on oh, stage. Yes. Yeah. So I have a song called Lady Divine and my grandmother passed away in 2008 and she had cancer and I before she passed I sat at her bedside and I sang her I think I sang her Oh My Mama and Lady Divine and I went on tour and I sort of knew that she was hospice was there and we knew that I probably wasn't going to see her again. And I was performing in the South of France, I think, and it was a festival and it was the open air. The night sky was out in front of me and I was, I was singing and I started singing lady divine and this very intense, feeling of her, of my grandmother washed over me. And I just, I felt her there. I felt her presence. And it was a, it was such a beautiful feeling to feel her spirit there. And after the show, I went back to my hotel and I I called my dad and he said right off the bat, did you get my email? Grandma died. And I was like, 
no, I didn't get your email, but I know, I know that she died because I, she, she came and said goodbye. Basically, that's what it felt like. And she had died earlier that day. Yeah, that, that's probably, aside from my dreams and writing songs related to that, that experience with, with my grandmother leaving, that's probably the most spiritual experience I've had in that way or connected. I've the most connected I've felt to the other side, I guess. Mm -hmm. I, I love this. I, um, I told a story recently about my dad having a similar experience of knowing the moment, knowing that his grandfather had just left and have, and he described it that same way, like his grandfather's presence washed over him. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I feel like this is something I've heard many times. There's yeah. that. I like how it's just so, it's so beautiful and so powerful. And it makes sense to me when it is someone, it is an ancestor. It's someone in your lineage, someone in your family that you would feel yeah. they're leaving their body that strongly. Mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah, it was, it was a really powerful experience. Yeah, sounds, it was really beautiful. Sounds beautiful. So you've brought up France a few times, and I'm just <laughs> like, that's my pure maternal line goes back to France. Oh, and, really? Yeah, we call my grandma Mime, which oh. is the French Canadian word yeah. for yeah. grandma. Um, and it's so interesting. So she's going to be 97 in a couple months. Oh my gosh. She's so old. She's so old, but she, dude, she's so strong. And like, she That's got that amazing. gnarly flu last year oh my that gosh. was killing people and she got through it. She was okay. Yes. It was awful, but she survived. She That's got wild. through breast cancer a few years ago. I swear. We used to always joke that she's never going to die. Me and oh my, my me and my mom. That's why I yeah. used to. Um, but so I was talking to her on the phone recently and I found out that she spoke French as a child. And I was like, what? I, I can't you didn't believe even I know. didn't know that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I know her so well. I've spent so much time with her in my life. And wow. um, so, you know, I just have kind of been following that line a lot lately and, and finally did get it back from Canada to France. And do, so do you know much about your French ancestors? I don't. I really don't. Yeah. Do you, do you I know, have, like, regions when you're over there? Are you like, oh, these are where my people were from? I don't, but you're inspiring me to find out. Mm -hmm. I feel like my lineage is so scattered that I haven't really, I haven't really kind of gone there yet. I think for a moment, maybe 10 years ago or seven years ago, I joined uh, Ancestry.com and I started sort of poking around and finding out names and I was really fascinated by it. And at a certain point, I think I, I don't know why I stopped, but I haven't gone back and I haven't had, I haven't had the time or space mm -hmm. for, for those extracurricular activities at this point. Totally. Yeah, I have the app on my phone. So, oh, nice. Like I do it when I'm nursing and that that's like all that. the time I have for genealogy yeah. right now. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. But I yeah, have I, just, really, um, I have a really incredible memoir book that my great grandma wrote before she passed away. Oh, and wow. there are some wonderful stories in there about my family. They were pioneers and they settled in Southern California um, before the turn of the century. So that is very fascinating. And I definitely, I knew my great grandmother pretty well. She passed away when I was maybe 19 something like that. But I spent a lot of my childhood getting to know her. Oh, I think I've, I remember I texted you when Vera was born that one of my great grandmothers was named Vera. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was so lucky. I knew three of my great grandmothers. Yeah, I really knew one of mine well. Yeah, of great great grandparents. Yeah. And, and then, she, yeah, wow, that she lived till you were 19. That's... Mm -hmm. Yeah, my last one died when I was 10. I think. 
Wow. Yeah, the generations are pretty close in my family. Uh-huh. A lot of people had kids when they were in their early 20s. I did not, mm-hmm. thankfully. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think about that a lot because, of course, you know, our generation are having kids later, a lot later, and that that, that does put more distance between generations. And so a lot of these younger kids aren't going to know their great-grandparents yeah. and grandparents as much. Vera and Una have a set of great grandparents. My grandparents are still alive, so that's wonderful. Wow. And they're they're young still. My great grandparents are only eighty one. Wow. Yeah. That's whose parents are they? They're my mom's parents. Uh-huh. Yeah. My mom will be sixty this next year and her parents are in their early eighties. Wow. That is they did do it young. <laughs> yeah. My mom had had my brother at 20, and I think my grandma, Sue, had her first when she was about 20 also. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, well, having my kids 10 years apart. Um, yes. <laughs> my Celia <laughs> knew. It. Totally. My Celia had four, all of her grandparents and four great-grandparents living when she was a kid, wow. just like I did. And now mm-hmm. Nixie, you know, no, not as much. Yeah. Um, okay, let's close by having you just tell people where, where they can find you and your music. Okay. Um, let, you can go to my website, aliladiane.com. My music's really available in all of the normal places where music is available. The internet, the iTunes, internet. Spotify. <laughs> record stores. You can order record stores. <laughs> you can order vinyl or CDs from my website directly. That's probably the best place to, to support, the best way to support an artist. And you're um, um, re-releasing the Pirate's Gospel? I um, am. Yeah, I'm re-releasing my first record on vinyl and CD. I've just been like working on all the artwork for that in these past this past month. So that will be exciting. I've been writing a lot of new songs too so there'll probably be a new record in the next I don't know two years <laughs> <laughs> something like that good I'm excited yeah. to get the pirates gospel on vinyl awesome thanks so much for speaking with me Amber it's nice to talk to you yeah thank you for sharing these beautiful stories Alila. my pleasure <laughs> thank you for taking these medicine stories in I hope they inspire you to keep walking the mythic path of your own unfolding self. I love sharing information and will always put any relevant links in the show notes. You can find my blog, handmade herbal medicines, past podcast episodes, and a lot more at mythicmedicine.love. While you're there, I invite you to click the purple banner across the top of the page to take my quiz, which healing herb is your plant familiar It's a fun and lighthearted quiz, but the results are really in-depth and designed to bring you into closer alignment with the medicine that you are in need of. If you love the show, please consider supporting my work at patreon.com slash medicine stories. There's some killer rewards there, um, exclusive content, access to online courses, free, beautiful, downloadable eBooks, coupon codes, giveaways, and just amazing gifts provided by past guests of the podcast. All of that stuff is at the $2 a month level. Um, For a little more, you can access my herbal ebook or my small online course. And that's all there as a thank you, a huge thank you from me and from my guests for listening, for supporting this work. I love figuring out what I can give to people on Patreon. It's so fun. And I love that Patreon makes it that you can um, contribute for such a small amount a month. I'm a crazy busy and overwhelmed mom and adding this project into my life has been a questionable move for sure, but I love doing it. And I love the feedback that I get from you all. And I just pray that the Patreon continues to allow me the financial wiggle room to keep on doing it while giving back to everyone who's listening. Um, If you're unable to do that, or if you'd like to support further, I would love it if you would subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you would review the podcast on iTunes too, really helps get it into other ears and it means so much to me when I read those reviews. It's um, 
like the highlight of my week when I check them and see new ones and people are amazing. You guys are wonderful. Thank you so much. The music that opens and closes the show is by Marie Sue, M-A-R-I-E-E-S-I-O-U-X. It's from her song Wild Eyes, which is one of my favorite songs of all time. Thank you so much. And I look forward to next time.